we asked Holmes, man, maybe, you, uh, maybe you're uh, uh, in one right now, maybe you just came out of one, or maybe you're so close to entering into one, indeed, that you can begin to smell it. You know how when the storm's getting ready to, uh, to come, man, and, and the next thing you know, man, you can begin to smell the rain that's getting ready just to open up. The heavens are just getting ready to open up and pour down on you like crazy. And you can begin to smell it. And sometimes I believe that as we begin ready to go into a storm in the spiritual praise, God, I believe that sometimes God will allow that sense to come out that we can begin to smell the rainstorm that we're getting ready to get into. But I also have to, uh, I have to say, and perhaps you agree with me, that oftentimes the very things that we consider to be such a storm, if we would honestly begin to break it down and truly look at it, we could actually call it a sprinkle. Yeah. <laughs> we claim they're storms, but oftentimes it's a sprinkle. Now, when we're living like our brothers and our sisters over there, and it seems like we're literally living through hell, that's one thing. I mean, her own words, she says, some people say we are living in hell. That's a storm. Now, I'm not trying to downplay anybody else's storms, but you got to agree with me. Oftentimes, what we consider a storm is a sprinkle. Yeah. Oftentimes, what we consider to be a breeze, or what, 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 what we say is a, uh, is a hurricane, is actually just a breeze. <laughs> we begin to look at it when it's happening to us, but it's absolutely devastating. Ah, but it's somebody else. Let me just turn the channel. It's absolutely crazy, the storms man, that our brothers and sisters indeed are facing. And we, we have them here, I know that. Yeah. We have people who are going through a storm because they don't have a job. And I get that, not trying to play the fact, downplay the fact that you don't have a job. But <coughs> what I want us to see, church, is that's oftentimes just a sprinkle. Because we have brothers and sisters overseas, men, who no longer have homes because of the faith they have in Jesus Christ. They've been burnt down to the ground. Yeah. That's a storm. We claim I don't have enough money at the end of the month to pay all my bills, and that stinks. But oftentimes, with the help that we have all around us, we can consider that to be a sprinkle. Because truth be told, we have brothers and sisters overseas who no longer have loved ones because their head has been violently decapitated. They have to flee from their country, some of them, because the violence is so rough and tough because they are refusing to convert over to Islam. That's a storm. I think that we could agree, man, that not having a job and or not having enough money at the end of the month to pay all of our bills, yes, indeed, stinks. But compared to their storm, ours is simply just a sprinkle. Now, indeed, we do have some people who are going through some true storms. you got people who are battling life or death with cancer. That's a storm. And then you have other people who are claiming they're in a storm, but they're in a sprinkle simply because their feelings got hurt. Amen. <laughs> Come on, somebody. You know it's true. <laughs> and it's absolutely unbelievable. But today, man, I don't want to talk about the storms we're in or the storms that we're not in. What I do want to begin to talk about today is I want us to praise him, not while we're in the storm. Yes, indeed, do that. But what I really want to touch base on today is praise him for the storm. Mm -hmm. That doesn't make any sense. But if you think about it, as Christians, we're called to be weird. To yeah. piggyback off of Wednesday's sermon series, man, that we started, it's called weird. And that's the very things that we're talking about. It's things that seem so weird, but yet we do them. And today I want us to be so weird in our walk with Christ Jesus that we will be so willing to begin to praise him for the storm. Not just praise him while we're in it, not praise him after it's over, but indeed praise him because he is sending a storm our way every time we go through something uncomfortable, something hard, something we don't like. What do we begin to do as Christians in general? We jump to the conclusion, the devil's at it again, I tell you something. <laughs> but have we ever stopped just for a second and think, maybe, just maybe, God Almighty is at it again. Amen. Every single storm church that we come across is not of the devil. A lot of them, yes, I'll give that to you. But every single storm we come across is not of the devil. Not every storm we come across is a bad thing. Some storms are of God and those storms are an awesome thing. He tells us in 1 Peter 1.7, he says this, Pure gold put in the fire comes out uh, comes." comes out of it proved pure. Genuine faith put through this suffering comes out proved genuine. When Jesus wraps this all up, it's your faith, not your gold, that God will put on display as evidence of his victory. Sometimes we have to go through a storm and to be proven pure. The devil is going to bring you through a storm to destroy you. Why God's going to bring you through a storm to prove you. 
everything that we go through, every storm that we're in is not of the devil, no matter how nasty or how bad it seems like we've just seen with this woman in her video. They're praying for revival. Her own words, man, we were praying for revival. Praying that her country would come alive in Christ Jesus. Praying, man, not for death, but indeed praying for life. And then what came? War. <coughs> Bombs came. I mean, have you ever been praying for something so hard, man? And next thing you know, it seems like simply hell is just breaking loose in your life. You've been praying so hard, and it seems like the only thing that's dropping is bombs all around you. To the fact that it even begins to make you pull back on the very thing that you're praying for. Where every time I pray for this, this seems to take place. So you begin to pull back on the very thing that you have been crying out for God to do. But my question in that is when the bombs are dropping all around you, that when the storm has just opened up and it's pouring down on you like crazy, do you go run and hide or do you simply dance in the freaking rain mm -hmm. to indeed prove your faith? She prays for revival, but yet a war breaks out. Now, when I got this, uh, we got this magazine this week and, 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 and this video this week, man, and so I was reading this, this magazine and, and the interview with her, and when I began to read that before I actually watched the video, man, as she was talking about how they were praying for a revival and the war broke out, I stopped reading it, and I said, Lord, this woman is praying for revival, and yet you drop bombs. That's the exact opposite of what my sister was praying for. She was praying for life, but yet it seems as though you're bringing death. She's praying for revival, but God, you're bringing this and you're bringing that, but yet then God dropped a bomb in my heart. Amen. And what I felt like he put on my heart was, Frank, <coughs> when are we the most appreciative of life? That's right. Yeah. It's in the midst of death. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. uh, Edgar, praise God for him. <coughs> His funeral was packed, slam out. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. And it should be. Awesome man. But my point is, death will pack out a house. Look at 9-11. Months after September 11, 2001, churches were packed, slam out. Death, destruction brought people to wanting life, brought people to wanting revival, brought people to wanting to have a relationship with Jesus. Yeah. Months later, those churches that were packed, slammed full, yeah. begin to dwindle down. But death will always bring life. And indeed, that is the same thing that is happening over there. I pray that in our country we never have to face that type of persecution, but at the same time, I oftentimes question myself, Lord, am I praying for the wrong thing? Mm -hmm. Am I hurting my people by praying that we never have to face that type of persecution? Should I start praying, God, bring on the rain? Should I start praying, Lord, allow that persecution to take place into our country? Because if that type of persecution honestly begins to take place in our country, maybe churches will stop fighting each other. Right. Maybe people inside churches right. will stop going right. behind other people, gossiping and stabbing people in the back. Don't yeah, let me yeah. get off on a rant for a second. <laughs> <laughs> but maybe if we have that type of a persecution... Maybe the body will actually begin to come together. Maybe if we have that type of a persecution, those who are sanctified, sold out soldiers for Christ will understand that it's all of our brothers and sisters who are lost out there that we got to begin to spread the gospel to. And maybe we'll stop having a peeing contest, which church looks better, and what congregation seems better, who's bringing in the most money, and all this nonsense, but we'll actually begin to come together to destroy the gates of hell and what it is that they're doing. Maybe that's when we'll have true revival up in our country. Right. Amen. Amen. Maybe, just maybe, I'm praying for the wrong thing. I pray, man, or I, as she begins to pray, man, she's praying, man, God, bring revival. Bring revival. War happens. Bombs begin to drop. And many people would begin to say, man, well, you know what? That, that, that's, not, that's, not what it, that's not an answer prayer. She's praying for this and she's delivered, she's delivered that, but at the same time, I got to ask you, have you ever stopped to think for a second that just perhaps those bombs aided in the revival? Amen. When those bombs started dropping, you better believe even people who don't believe in Jesus started calling upon Amen. his name. Hello. 
You see it with so many atheists and agnostic people today. I don't believe, I don't believe. Gun to your head, Jesus! So you do believe. Okay, amen. You know what I'm saying? And indeed, that begins to happen. The goal of, of Syria, man, was to, to snuff out, to rid this country of Christians. And the very people they're trying to rid this country of, they're Muslims. Some of them, many of them, are beginning to give their life to Christ Jesus. Amen. And true revival is indeed beginning to take place over there. The very thing that she prayed for, as bombs begin to drop, so too did a revival. Mm -hmm. Even though to many it looks as if they are living in hell, but you have people like Sam or her husband. And that beautiful, beautiful woman who in the midst of the storm don't smell death. They don't smell war. They don't smell the storm, but they smell the rainmaker. And his name is Jesus. And because they know the smell of Christ Jesus, and they know what they are called to do, it doesn't matter to them what's going on around them. They will stand wherever it is that he calls them to stand. They will stand in revival. They will stand in war. They will stand in life. And they will stand in death because ultimately they know no matter how violent the storm or how big the storm, I know who creates the rain and his name is Jesus. So what we will choose to do is that of dance. We will simply dance in the rain. You see it, man. I, I love what she says. She says that her and her husband threw themselves before God. I'm just going to get in my prayer time and nail down on my knees. Man, they said, man, we threw ourselves before God. We don't want nothing else, but Lord, tell us indeed what it is that you want us to do. I love this, though. Listen to this quote. God, as Christians, what do you want us to do? My goodness. If we would begin, God, as Christians, what do you want? want me to do? What do you want me to say? Can you imagine how much of the nonsense actually would not take place? Yeah. But they say, God, what do you want us to do? Not what do, as a couple, baby, what should we do? As, hu as, as husband and wife, what should we do? As parents, baby, what should we do? <laughs> no, man, they said, God, as Christians, what do you want us, I'm putting aside my fears, I'm putting aside my worries, I'm putting aside my concerns, I'm putting aside my desires. I want to know, Jesus, what do you want me to do? Could have easily cried out, God, stop the storm. Stop the war. Pull me out of this violence. What the heck, God? Don't you see that it's pouring cats and dogs over here? Can you stop the rain already? But yet they begin to pray, God, bring on the rain. God, bring on the rain, indeed, if that's what it's going to take to give you glory. Jesus, I just want to know, do I need my umbrellas or do I need my dancing shoes? Mm -hmm. You simply tell me what it is that you want me to do, and God, that's what I'll do. But can you imagine, church, if we begin to live our life, God, today, do I need my umbrella or do I simply need my dancing shoes? Which one is it that you want me to do? Do you want me to stay inside while it's raining cats and dogs? Or do you want me to step outside and let it pour all the way around me as I begin to dance to simply bring you glory and show everybody else I ain't afraid of the storm that's coming my way. I ain't afraid of the violence that's going on around me because I have the rainmaker himself that's living within me. God, what is it that you want me to do? Ultimately, right now in Syria, that's what this mighty man and this mighty woman that we've just seen indeed are doing. They are simply dancing. In the interview that I read in the magazine, it, it, it says that um, when, when, when she began to ask God, she said, what will you have me to do to be your witness? Not only what do you want us to do as Christians, God, but what will you have me to do as your witness? Talk about Romans 12, 1 and 2, living sacrifice. Mm -hmm. God, what do you simply want me to do to be a witness for you? And I love what she says. She says, God asked her, would you give me your life? And we heard that part on that. A.K.A. God is asking her, would you be so willing to dance with me in the rain? She said, I realized that God wanted all of me. And I said, yes, she said. 
the next day, Lord, what would you have me to do to be a witness, she said. And he said, would you be willing to give me your husband, a.k.a. would you be willing to allow me to call your husband out on a dance floor? And would you be okay with him dancing with me in this storm? Would you be okay with him dancing with me in the rain? Would you be okay with giving me your husband's life? And praise the Lord, she says yes. Third day is the most difficult, she said. It's the hardest, she said. And she began to ask God again, God, what would, you, what would you want me to do to be a witness? And he says, would you give me your children's life? Would you give me the opportunity to pull your children out onto the dance floor in the midst of the violence, in the midst of the storm, in the middle of all this rain? Would you allow your kids to come out and dance with me? Or are you going to stop them? And would you stop dancing with me yourself if indeed I called your kids out to dance with me? Are you willing to give me your kids? And praise the Lord, she said, yes. Understand, church, they could have thrown in the towel at any moment. A place in Europe, a church in Europe, had already reached out to them for what it is that they're doing over there and said, listen, we have a house for you. We have positions in our churches for you. We have private schools that we are already enrolling your kids in. Do you want to come to Europe? They had a decision to make. Listen, church, terrorists knew who they were. They know where they live. They are not, they're not safe where it, where it is that they are at. They're not safe what they're doing, spreading the gospel to Muslims. But indeed, they chose to stay. Amen. They chose to continue to dance in the rain, and it's so beautiful to see faith like that in the midst of chaos. They had the opportunity to leave. But yet they stay. And I love what they said, that God uh, gave us our precious children and he has the freedom to take them back. One night she gets into it, man, and uh, when, when, when the war is going crazy, man, they hear bombs going off, uh, screams, they hear gunshots and all kinds of stuff going off, man. And she says that that's when she knew that she had to uh, tell her, her kids, indeed, that something one day may happen. So she points to the front door and she says, look at that door. In the interview, this is her quote. One day, God may allow, which that should set us at ease right there. God may allow. While I'm going through a storm, well, then God allowed it, and that should set you at ease. Because if God allowed you to walk into the storm, God would give you the power to walk out of it. God will pull you through it. God will deliver you from it. It, will, it should set you at ease to know that if God had allowed you to go into it, then that God also controls it. So be at ease. But she said that God may allow someone of these terrorist people to come in that door. They will have big beards and very threatening faces, she said. Maybe they will have swords, and they will put the swords on our neck, and you may see blood, and they will hurt us. We will have pain, but don't worry about this pain. For we will close our eyes, and we will open them again in heaven, and we will be with Jesus, singing with the angels. That's beautiful. Can you imagine as a mom and dad, not just uh, uh, hypothetically telling your kids, but honestly telling your kids when somebody and because you believe that this is going to take place when somebody comes to cut your head off honey i want you to simply tell them that you forgive them and that jesus loves them wow she asked the question about what type of mother is she she's a phenomenal Amen. awesome mother yeah. Amen. that she would begin to teach her kids to say nothing else to them don't convert Nothing else to them but I forgive you and Jesus Christ is in love with you. I think more often times than not, man, we begin to look at storms as, as, as being a, a bad thing instead of a divine thing. And they're fasting and praying before God and that's when they begin to, for, for God to drop that bomb on them and tell them, indeed, I want you to stay at no matter what the cost. Would we be willing to stay at no matter what the cost? Would we be willing to stay in our walk at no matter what the cost? People coming against you or things not working out, are you willing to stay at no matter what the cost? And are you willing to stay with your kids at no matter what the cost? If the cost is your kids, are you willing to stay? That's what Jesus was simply asking these people. Some people ask the question, well, why on earth would they begin to stay if they had everything mapped out for them? They could get into freedom. They could step and have a wonderful life, a safe environment to raise their kids. That's what a good mom and dad would do. Why did they stay? Why? 
because the very thing that they have prayed for is the very thing that is taking place, revival. The lost are coming to Christ Jesus. They stayed for that one terrorist, that one terrorist with a threatening face, that one terrorist with a big beard, that one terrorist with a gun, that one terrorist with a bomb, that one terrorist with a sword who is so willing and desires to put it on their neck. They stayed so that he could hear that Jesus loves you. Whether it comes from the mouth of her dying self, the mouth of her dying husband, or the mouth of her two beautiful dying children. She wanted, he wanted, they wanted at least one terrorist to hear that Jesus loves them. They were willing to take that risk for Christ Jesus. They were willing to continue to dance in the rain. They were willing to bring attention to what is going on with our brothers and sisters over in Syria right now. And again, I can't help but to think of Stephen. I can't help but to think of Stephen, man, when, when, uh, 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 when he was beginning to be stoned and uh, he begins to look up to the heavens. Didn't get out of the way of the stones. He simply looks up to the heavens. And these weren't just pebbles, man. These were, these were rocks, baby, yeah. that they begin to pound him with. And he begins to look up to the heavens. And one can only imagine the sheer glory of it when God Almighty is sitting there, when Jesus is sitting there, and every other time I preached on it, but every other time in Scripture when it references Jesus at the throne of God, man, understand he's sitting. But to begin to look up to the heavens, and as you begin to see the hands of Jesus begin to rip open the sky, part the clouds, and as he begins to come up out of that seat with a smile on his face, now giving Stephen a standing ovation, understand Stephen was locked on Jesus, was not concerned about anything else that was going on around him. He was concerned about his commander-in-chief giving that soldier a standing ovation. And as Jesus began to salute, salute him and say, that's my son whom I am well pleased, understand, he simply allowed Stephen to fall asleep. Amen. And I can't help but to think that the same thing is going on with this family. That if the day comes, that indeed the terrorists do break down their door and begin to line up their Christian Christ sold out soldier bodies, begin to pull the hair back from their neck to line it up, man, to slice and dice, I can't help but to think that they too will look up and see the hands of Christ Jesus begin to split the heavens. And as he will be arising up out of his seat, their commanding officer, I can't, their commanding chief officer, man, I can't help but to think that he too will begin to salute, Amen. salute his soldiers. And they will cry out the same. I forgive you. And Jesus Christ loves you. As they meet their death, as they meet the cup that Jesus Christ already drank, and Jesus begins to take it from them and says, No, you don't have to drink, it already did. You just simply close your eyes, and here in a few seconds, you're going to open them back up, and you'll be in my presence. I hate to say it like this, but in a sense, you're killing two birds with one stone. What do I mean? They're going into paradise with Jesus, baby. And this one Muslim, this one terrorist, will begin to hear how much it is that Jesus loves them. He'll begin to see that this people are sold out for the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And church, I'm here to tell you, it's the same thing with you. No matter what the storm is that you're going through, you want a standing ovation from Jesus Christ? Dance in the rain. No matter how violent the storm, no matter what's coming down upon you, you simply dance in the rain when everybody else is saying this, accusing or accusations or blaming or finger pointing or backstabbing or coming down against you, whatever it may be, you simply continue to dance and understand Jesus will begin to come up out of his seat, split opens the heavens, look down at you and salute you in the mighty name of Jesus and say, that's my son, that's my daughter, job well done my good and faithful servant. He did it for Stephen. He would do it for them. He would do it for you. When we begin to cry out, Jesus, bring the rain. Now understand, that's a bold, a very bold, bold statement. And it reminds me of Judges chapter 4. See, in Judges chapter 4, man, there was a king. His name was a Gibeon, man, and, and, and this king was the king of Cana, and, and, and he reigned in Hazar, and he had a commander of his army. And the commander of this army, his name was Sisera, and he, uh, 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 he had uh, 
hundreds and thousands of soldiers, amen. And, and on this particular verse, in verse 3, man, it talks about uh, 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 just a few of them, but it says, And the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. For Jabian had 900 chariots of iron, and for 20 years he harshly oppressed the children of Israel. The children of Israel indeed were in a storm. We see in verse 4, and it says, Now uh, uh, Deborah, a, a prophetess, the, the wife of uh, Lapidoth, uh, was judging Israel at this time. And if we go down to verse 6, it says, Then she sent and called for Barak, the son of Abinwam, uh, uh, from Kiddush in uh, Nabatali. And he said to him, uh, she said to him, Has not the Lord God of Israel <clears throat> commanded and deployed troops at Mount Tabar? Take with, take with you 10,000 men of the sons of Naphtali and of the sons of Zabalon. And he, she says, And against you I will deploy Sisera, the commander of Jabin's army, and his chariots and his multitude at the river of Kishon. I will deliver him into your hand. Now remember, at the river of Kishon, okay? He says, I will deliver him into your hands. Now you go to verse 8, and it says, And Barak said to her, If you will go with me, then I will go. But if you don't go with me, then I will not go. So she goes with him, but understand, she said, well, in me doing this, I want you to understand, man. Man's not going to get the glory. Ultimately, God Almighty is, but God's going to get the glory using a woman. Mm -hmm. So for the male chauvinists out there who don't <laughs> think that, men, that God will use women, women can't this and women can't that, you're male chauvinists and most likely, 99% of the time, you're jealous of the woman. You want her position, but you ain't as good as she is, and she got the position. Can we just be real for a second? Hallelujah. So, and indeed, she says, but I'm going to go. But understand, I'm, through God Almighty, going to get the glory, not you. God's going to be known that he used a woman to do a man's job. That's ultimately what she says to him. And it says, so they, they go up to this Mount Tabar, and then they're getting their troops ready. Well, word gets down to Sisera, man, and, and his troops, that they're up there ready to, to wreak havoc. And it says this in verse 14. Then Deborah said to Barak, Up! For this is the day which the Lord hath delivered Sisera into your hands. Has not the Lord gone out before you? So Barak went down from Mount Tabar with 10,000 men following him. And the Lord routed Sisera and all of his chariots, and all of his army with the edge of the sword from Barak. And Sisera alighted from his chariot and fled away on foot. But Barak pursued the chariots and the army uh, as far as uh, Herosheth. And it says, And all the armies of Sisera fell on the edge of the sword. Not a man was left. God did exactly what it was that God said he would do. Now remember, God said that I will destroy them. I will hand them over to you at the river of Kishon. But to truly understand what begins to take place in verses 14, 15, 16, and 17, we actually have to go over to another chapter. We have to go to chapter 5. And see, chapter 5 in the book of Judges, man, is simply a song. It's a song, it's a victory song of the war that they just fought, the war that they just went through in Judges chapter 4. But I want to point out two verses, uh, uh, chapter 5, verse 4, and chapter 5, verse 21. And it says, when you march from the field of Edom, it says, the earth trembled and the heavens poured, the clouds also poured water. It rained. Okay? <laughs> 21, the torrent of uh, Kishon swept away, uh, uh, swept, uh, from Kishon swept them away. The ancient torrent, the torrent of Kishon, oh my soul, march on in strength. The torrent simply means a, a stream of water flowing with a great rapid violence. A violent downpour of rain. Jesus, bring the rain. What am I saying, man? Just perhaps, just maybe... Barak and his men would have lost their lives had God not brought on a violent storm to hinder the enemy. Amen. Perhaps the enemies would have gotten away if God did not bring on that violent storm that slowed down their chariots. Not every rainstorm that comes our way is a bad thing. Not every rainstorm that comes our way is against us. Some of the rainstorms are a divine thing. Some of the rainstorms indeed are for us. And that's exactly what began to take place here. God brought 
the rain. The God we served in this chapter drops rainstorms like bombs. Amen. He indeed brought the rain to slow down, to hinder, to destroy the enemy. In verse 14, uh, 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 it says that she says, Bear it up and you know. And he had been thinking, man, you woman, you must be out of your mind. It is raining cats and dogs. It is violence out there right now. The wind is blowing. The storm is coming down. There is no way I'm stepping out there right now. And she's going, dude, are you serious? She said, man, this is the day that the Lord has delivered him into your hands. See, she began to recognize what would become of the dirt that the horses and the chariots and the soldiers are marching on. She begins to realize with the downpouring of this violent storm on that dirt, it's going to turn to mud. And those horses are going to get stuck. Those wheels are no longer going to move. They're going to be bogged down. This is the day that the Lord has delivered him into your hands. Bear it up. Has not the Lord gone before you? Amen. Yes, indeed, he has, and he has done it in the shape of rain dropping like bombs. Right. It was telling him, man, just pay attention to indeed what is going on before you, going on around you. And if we too would begin to grab a hold of that, if we have the faith and the hope to know that God goes before us, then church, no matter how bad the storm, no matter how violent the storm, shouldn't we always be willing to dance in the storm with courage and boldness Amen. if we know that God has gone before us? Amen. Don't worry about the size of the storm. Don't worry about the violence of the storm. Just continue to dance in the mighty name of Jesus. If God Almighty makes your path straight, if God Almighty raises the dead, if you believe that he did conquer death, hell, and the grave, like my father said just the other day, if God Almighty created the heavens and the earth, ain't everything else pretty much simple for him? That's right. well, let's just be real for a minute. So if indeed we believe that, and I pray that you do, then no matter what storm it is, we got to understand that he even created the rain. So therefore, we should acknowledge that indeed it's safe to dance in. Barak and his men then begin to race down the mountain as God is bringing this massive rainstorm. And you know they're thinking in their mind, God, why, why, why now? Why, why can't we have a, a nice day, maybe a cool breeze? I wouldn't even mind like a, a, a little sprinkle. But Jesus, why did you have to bring on this crazy rainstorm? As I come rushing down this mountain, I have to worry about all my men going to be able to hold their footing. I have to worry about, man, am I going to be able to see everything that's going around me, but not with a storm and wind and all this stuff blowing in my face. God, why don't I just give up now until he begins to see the same thing that the prophetess begin to see? The dirt ground becoming soft, be turning into mud. Seeing it as becoming a sinking pit for his enemy. Perhaps, church, right now you got a rainstorm hanging over your head like crazy. Start looking around. Start looking at the ground as a sinking pit, not for you, but indeed as a sinking pit for your enemy. Instead of looking up, crying out, why? Putting your head down, ready to die. Begin to look around and see what actually God is doing. Your ground turning into mud to not hinder you but to slow down your enemy. The ground turning into mud not to bog you down but to bog down your enemy. He says that the, the river Kishon overflowed sweeping many of the Canaanites away as they tried to flee across it. Isn't that awesome? As they're trying to flee across it, man, it says that it talks about how it overflowed in that psalm. It destroyed them and it swept them away. And they tried to cross over that, that bed that God had arose, uh, uh, down, uh, had God has rose up, man, from the violent downpour that he uh, opened up because God brought the rain. Amen. And it says, Barak and his men pursued and not one of Israel's enemies was left. And go home and read the story because it's a really cool ending. Uh, 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 Sisera actually gets away. 
And he actually ends up going to a tent of a female. And, and in this tent, he says, listen, baby doll, he says, if you'll do me a favor, man, it would be absolutely awesome. One, can I have a glass of milk? And he says, uh, uh, two, I'm going to lay my head down. And if men come looking for me, don't let them know that I'm here. But how many of us know that God is everywhere? Amen. Amen. So they had a peace treating with this people. But since God is everywhere, he was going to see to it that not one of God's enemies was going to escape. So as he slept, my woman gets a peg, a tent peg. <laughs> and a hammer and softly approaches him as he sleeps, puts it to his temple, pow, wow. pounds it in, goes out the other side of his temple, and it sticks him in the ground. And then she goes outside and she waits for Barry. And she says, Honey, just so you know, the man that fled from you is right here. <laughs> Praise the Lord. So God literally destroyed every single one of their enemies. What's my point in all of this? I think more often times than not, we look at storms, we look at downpours as a bad thing instead of a divine thing. They're getting ready for battle. It starts raining. You know they're thinking, God, what the heck, bro? Why did you have to open this up now? Can it get any worse? You know, they're already intimidated by this, by this army. I mean, can it get any worse than what it is that you're doing instead of, say, instead of saying, God, thank you. Thank you, my Lord Jesus, for bringing the rain. As Deborah began to say to him, Oh! You know the first word that he thought was, Shot! Uh, I ain't getting up right now. I, there ain't no way I'm going to get wet. I am not fighting in this. I didn't even bring my umbrella, Ella, Ella, Ella. I mean, I'm not about to do it. You know what I'm saying? And she says, But don't you get it? I don't need your umbrella, nor do you. You got your dancing shoes. That's all you need. Begin to dance. She said, you smell that? That's not war. That's not even death. <coughs> what that is, is the presence of the Lord. Amen. And he simply wants you to dance. Church, I don't know what you're facing. I don't know the storms you're facing, the storms in marriage, the storms in your finances, the storms at work, the storms at school, the storms in relationships, the storms just in life that life brings upon us, the storms in our mind. My goodness, can we admit that we all have storms in our mind? I don't know what storms you're going through, but understand, whatever the storm, God is sending an awesome, violent downpour your way, but violent in a holy way. Violent not to destroy you, Violent not to stop you, but indeed violent to stop, to bog down your enemy. Amen. He's sending a flood your way, but not to drown you, but a flood your way to drown your enemy. A flood to sweep your enemy away. And in this storm of, of Barak, man, understand the Lord brought it to destroy every single enemy that they were facing. So too is the storm that God is bringing your way, the rain that God is bringing your way. It is not there to destroy you, so don't look at it like that. Mm -hmm. Begin to praise Him, begin to dance, him, dance with Him in the rain because He is going to destroy every single trial, tribulation. He is going to destroy every trouble. He's going to destroy uh, every struggle that you have, every battle and every enemy that you're facing. Amen. Will we face more? 100%. But in this particular storm, understand God is sending rain your way to destroy them. Don't hate the rain. Dance in it. After all, isn't that what it means to be a Christian? Aren't we supposed to begin to dance? So church, understand when the enemy begins to start to come against you, dance. When the enemy begins to hate you, dance. When you got more bills to pay out than money in your banking account, dance. When you don't have insurance but you just found a lump, begin to dance. When it seems like nothing is going your way, begin to dance. When your loved one wants to walk away, begin to dance. When your kids are going astray, begin to dance. When people want to stab you behind your back, begin to dance. When you find out their faith, begin to dance. Just begin to dance. When the enemy says there's no way, church, there's always a way and it starts with dancing. When you smell that smell and you know that the rain is coming, just start dancing. Because I promise you this, he's going to send you a downpour and it's going to be a blessing. So dance. I'm going to close with this story. 
A cold march, a cold march wind danced around the dead of night in Dallas as a doctor walked into a small hospital room of Diana Blessing. She was still groggy from surgery. Her husband David held her hand as they braced for them as they braced themselves for the latest news. That afternoon of March 10th, 1991, some complications forced Diana, only 24 weeks pregnant, to undergo an emergency C-section to deliver the couple's new daughter, Dana Blessing. She was a whopping 12 inches long and weighed in at one pound and nine ounces. They already knew that she was dangerously premature. Still, the doctor's soft words dropped like bombs when they heard the news. I don't think she's going to make it, he said, as kindly as he could. There's only a 10% chance she will live through the night, and even then, if by some slim chance she does make it, her future could be a very cruel one. None with this belief, David and Diana listened as the doctor described the devastating problems Dana would most likely face if she survived. She would never walk, she would never talk, she would most likely be blind, and she would certainly be prone to other catastrophic conditions such as cerebral palsy and complete mental retardation. On and on and on he goes with a list. <coughs> All Diana could begin to do was to cry out, No, no, God, please, no. She and David with their five-year-old son, Dustin, had long dreamed of the day that they would have a daughter to become a final family of four. Now within a matter of hours, the dream seems as if though it was slipping away. But as the first few days pass, a new agony began to set in for David and Diana because Dana's undeveloped nervous system was essentially raw. The lightest kiss or even caress only intensified her discomfort and pain. So they could not even cradle their tiny baby girl against their chest to offer strength for their love. All they could do as all they could do as Dana struggled, Dana struggled along beneath the ultra velvet light, tangled in the tubes and wires, was to pray that God would stay close to their precious baby girl. There was never a moment when Dana suddenly grew stronger, but as weeks went by, she did slowly gain an ounce of weight here and an ounce of strength there. And at last, when Dana turned two months old, her parents were able to hold her in their arms for the very first time. And two months later, though the doctors continued to gently but yet grimly warn them that her chances of survival, much less living any kind of a normal life, was next to zero, Dana went home from the hospital just as her mother had prayed. <laughs> Five years later, when Dana was a petite but feisty young girl with glittery gray eyes and an unquenchable zest of life, she showed no signs whatsoever of mental or physical impairment. Simply, she was everything that a little girl can be and should be and so much more. But that happy ending is far from the end of Dana's story. One blistering afternoon in the summer of 1996, near her home in Irving, Texas, Dana was sitting in her mother's lap in the bleachers of a local ballpark where her brother Dustin had baseball practice. As always, Dana was chatting nonstop with her mother and several other adults sitting nearby when she suddenly fell silent, hugging her arms across her chest. Little Dana asked, oh, Do you smell that? Smelling the air, she detected the approach of a thunderstorm. And Diana said, yeah, baby girl, it smells like we're going to get rain. And Dana closed her eyes and asked again, no, Mom, do you smell that? And once again, her mom said, yes, I told you, uh, baby, I think we're about to get wet. It smells like rain. Still caught in the moment, Dana shook her head, patted her thin shoulders with her small hands and loudly announced, no, Mom, it smells like him. It smells like Jesus when you lay your head upon his chest. Tears running down her mother's face, Dana happily hopped off of her mother's lap, and as it started to rain, she began to dance. Dana knew, Diana knew that 
that her daughter's words confirmed what she and David and the other members of the Blessing family had prayed all along. That during those long days and those long nights as uh, of the first two months of their baby girl's life, when the nerves were too sensitive for them to be able to touch, caress, and hold, and love on their baby girl. In the midst of that storm, God was holding Dana pressed against his chest. And they danced in the rain. And it's his loving scent that she remembers so well. Church, dance with Jesus in the rain. It doesn't matter what you're going through. Amen. It doesn't matter who or what is around you because they or it will fall. But Jesus never will. Dance with him in the storm. Dance with him in the rain because I promise you this. The rain is eventually going to stop. But you being pressed up against the chest of Jesus never has to. Don't worry about your umbrella. Get on your shoes. And dance with him in the rain. Hop up, hop off of the lap of your depression. Hop off of the lap of, of, of this struggle and that trial and this tribulation and that struggle. Hop off of the lap of the very things that are trying to drown you. And begin to look around and see that the downpouring of the rain is not against you, but indeed it is for you. He's going to prove you pure. Keep your face, keep your body pressed against his chest and dance in the rain. Will you pray with me? Father God, we thank you. We praise you. We love you. God, you're just so amazing, so breathtaking, my God. And we thank you indeed, Jesus, that no matter what the storm brings, no matter how violent the rain, no matter how uh, 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 violent the, the, the flowing, Lord Jesus, of the rivers, my Lord God, of sorrows, of, 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 of pain, my Lord God, of, of desperation, Jesus. God, let us to put our shoes on and let us to dance with you, my King. God, let us to know, my Lord God, that that when it starts pouring down, Jesus, you're doing it to not bog us down, but to bog down our enemy. God, that when you're raising that river, God, let us know that at the end of it, it's not going to be our sorrows. Indeed, it will be the enemies, my Lord God, for even daring to think that he can come against your sons or your daughters. Jesus, let us not worry about what other people say, what other people think, my Lord Jesus, what other people want to do, my Lord God. Let us simply put on our shoes, whether anybody else wants to put on theirs, let us put on our shoes and dance in our reign, my Lord God. For indeed, you reign on high, my Lord. And we thank you, Jesus, that we can cry out, Jesus, bring the rain. That we can cry out, Jesus, we thank you for the rain. That we can begin to see, my Lord God, your hand in everything that you are allowing, my Lord God. Jesus, sometimes we're not going to understand the rain. But Lord, you didn't call us to. You're simply saying if we're going to pick up an umbrella or if we're going to put on our dancing shoes. And my King, I pray today that your people, our brothers and our sisters, will indeed put away the umbrella and begin to slip on their dancing shoes. God, we love you. We praise you. Thank you.